All right, so since there's no homework questions from all your homework you did this weekend, we're going to move on to trig modeling. We're on worksheet 15. And, uh, yeah. First, right out of the gate, we're going to talk about Mr. Rashad. So here's what we have to figure out when we are looking at trig models and trying to create the sinusoidal model. Now, the name sinusoidal is a little... Um, deceptive because kids sometimes view that as like oh I have to use a sine function no because remember cosine and sine are the same function just one has a phase shift on it um, so it's all it's all about your interpretation so make it easy so here's what I'm thinking about if I'm writing a sinusoidal model I have a few things I have to interpret first of all I need to figure out what the amplitude value is so sometimes based on the graph that I create is very obvious sometimes based on the story problem is very obvious um, but sometimes you have to calculate it on the harder ones. So just remember that the amplitude is half of the range. So it's max minus min divided by 2. And we also have to remember if there's a reflection in our graph, this is where it would show up, right? So I'm just going to generically put y equals amplitude. And then you either put down sine or cosine. And then inside the sine and cosine function, this is where it starts to get interesting you're going to have a B value that we're probably going to have to calculate because nowhere in nature are they like, hey, the B value is this. They might tell you the frequency or the period length, but then we can calculate the B value. Now, inside, you might see a phase shift. And very likely today, you will always see, not always, but often see a phase shift because we're just going to start the function at the easiest place that we see. So I'm going to use T because they use T a lot today for time. And then the phase shift which I'm just going to call shift. I don't have a variable to call that right now. I don't want to confuse everybody with an H because there's an H later on in the problem. And then over here, you're going to have plus something. This is going to be your midline or your vertical shift. So all of these things are going to be really, really obvious once we get a really horrible sketch down on our paper. And you've seen my sketches. These are going to be worse than normal. Okay, I'm going to try my best now. Rashad and his Ferris wheel. All right, so Rashad is my kind of dude. He needs to know exactly how high up he is on the Ferris wheel at any given moment. In fact, later on in the problem, he wants to know his height at four and one-third seconds. That is attention to detail. Let's read through all the information here, guys. Notice it's suggested, and on your test it will be required, that you give a little sketch. So blah, 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 here's Rashad, the Ferris wheel starts going, this is where he starts, like someone else got loaded onto the Ferris wheel, and he starts his little stopwatch at that point, and he notices a few things. First of all, Rashad, it takes him three seconds to reach the top. That clue right there tells me that along this axis, which is where you're writing down all your time information, forget zero seconds, I know something about three seconds. All right, I need to bust out some highlighter lines. So, his Ferris wheel will not be scraping the ground. That would be a really awful Ferris wheel. So make sure your Ferris wheel is not on the ground. Oh, no, undo. Hold on. Got a weird line. There we go. <laughs> um, I know some of you like to use the axes as your midlines. Just label things, right? So at three seconds, his Ferris wheel, or him, his seat, he's at the top of the Ferris wheel. So basically, he's going to have this sort of shape going on, which tells me I have what? Cosine or sine? I'm going to call it cosine, and I'm going to start it right there with a phase shift. It's okay. Phase shifts are not hard today. They're actually easier to work with, in my opinion. Now, technically, we know that this backs up. And this is where he really started at time of zero. I just don't know that I really care about that right now. So let's keep reading. What was that height? Oh, 43 feet above the ground. So this maximum height for the Ferris wheel is 43. And then we keep reading. There's some more information in here. He also determines that it took eight seconds for him to get back up to whatever that original position was. So that right there is period. So... From any point on the Ferris wheel, to get back to that same point, it takes him eight seconds. So like, for instance, from here to here, that's going to take a distance or a time of eight seconds, because that's the period. 
So can you help me label this marker? It's not really important that you do this, but I think it helps with your picture. Yeah, Adam tells me that means we're at 11 seconds at that point. Eight seconds later would be 11 seconds. All right, we have a lot of important information. There's one more piece out here. You just got to read it. The diameter of the wheel is how big? 40 feet. So the range of the entire graph is the same as the diameter of the wheel. So if from top to bottom is 40 feet, that means this low line here is 3, because that would be a total distance, a range of 40. And then you can either calculate or visualize the midline. Well, 20 would be half of your range, 20 and 20, so you could think of it that way. 23 would be the midline then. Now for those of us who love calculating things, maybe we find the midline by using our max plus min divided by 2 thing. 43 plus 3 is 46. 46 divided by 2 is totally 23. So if you're a visual learner, a visual interpreter, maybe you go off the graph. I have to do everything because I have a lot of things battling against my, my common sense. If I just calculate something blindly and I don't see a picture for it, there's a very high probability that I've done something wrong. So I do both. I got a picture, I got calculations, I look and I make sure they make sense. Hey, speaking of things that we need for our um, calculations, I kind of glossed over this, but what was the amplitude? 20, good. So there's a lot of things we know right now, guys. The amplitude is 20, the period is 8, the midline is 23. We know it's cosine, we know there's a phase shift. The only thing we don't know is B. B is calculated by taking 2 pi and dividing whatever the period length is. So they're measuring time in seconds in this problem, so you can keep it as period of 8 seconds. So your B value, 2 pi over 8, better known as pi over 4. Good. All right, so if I kind of go through, I have all of the pieces of information I need. They want you to write your function down here. We're choosing to start our function here at a cosine graph. You guys told me it's not reflected but I need to write down the amplitude size. You already told me what this was. What was the amplitude? 20, very good. So throw a 20 in front. Because of the way we're starting the function, it's we're gonna call it a cosine. I don't know why I'm writing in blue, try again. Inside that cosine graph, first thing you throw down is the B value, which y'all just calculated. B was pi over four. Now, because there's a phase shift, you have to open another set of parentheses so that B value and phase shift are separated, so it's in factored form. And this is where I do have to get kind of picky about this. They want you to use T for your input variable, so you have to use T. And then having a phase shift of right 3, wouldn't it look like that? T minus 3. And then plus the midline, which you found a long time ago. This K, this midline is plus 23. All right, so finding all the clues and putting them in the right spot essentially in the formula is what's a little tricky. From here on out, I'm going to make my technology work for me. So everybody go to your calculator. I need you to first check that your calculator is in radian mode, and I need you to very carefully type that function into Y1. Nothing else should be graphed, no plots, nothing. I already forgot what it was. There we go, 20. didn't want that at all. You do need those double parentheses and you're going to have to use x instead of t. Make sure you close the phase shift and you close the cosine function before you hit the plus 23 on the end for the vertical shift. Y'all checked for radian mode. That's usually the most common mistake from kids is they're in degree mode and it doesn't work out. Now we're going to go to our window. So in modeling questions, the windows make a whole lot more sense because X is measuring time. Uh, my window is from a previous question in first hour pre-calc. So let's look at the questions they're going to be asking me. Rashad needs to calculate things like 6 seconds, 9 seconds, 0 seconds. So for time, I'm just going to go from like 0 to, I think I want 12 seconds for no particular reason. I just got to make sure I can see enough of the time axes so I can answer all of his questions. Now for height, the y's, I can see the height range based on my graph. Remember how it went from 3 to 43 feet? So I like to give myself a little bit of extra window there. 
So I'm going to go from 0 to 45. Whoa, that's just crazy business. That's okay. You can do whatever as long as you can see what you need to see. Now when you hit graph, oh, that's magical. You could really envision Rashad up there, probably by himself, calculating. Because he has no friends, I guess. Poor guy. Oh. I can just imagine him at the top of the Ferris wheel, like, hey guys, just another point two seconds. You're going to be there. Poor dude. All right, so let's answer some questions. At six seconds, how high up is Rashad? Now you can go to your table and you can do it that way. You'd have to be in ask mode for these questions. I'm just going to go off my graph because I have a good window. So I'm going to hit trace and then type six, enter, which I think it already was on six. So Rashad, you are approximately 8.9 feet up in the air. Thrilling. What's the next question? Four and a third seconds. That is a very specific request from Rashad. Now, how do you type in four and a third? Because you can't say 4.3. It's not going to be very accurate. You could do a whole bunch of threes, or you could say four plus one third, or you can say 13 thirds. But, you know, when we get to like life or death questions in math, you don't want to be ish in your answer. So literally four and a third is four plus one third. He is exactly 33 feet off the ground. Hot dog. How about at nine seconds? I don't know, but I bet we can find out. Here you go, buddy. You're 23 feet in the air now. This poor dude. He belongs on the math team, I'd say. Send him an invite. This is a good time for Rashad. And zero seconds. Remember when he started his stopwatch and he wasn't really at the ground because other people got on the Ferris wheel? Let's figure out how high up Rashad was. About 8.9 feet. So his little legs were dangling. He was calculating. Um, that's why we didn't start at zero. That's why we just went, you know what, let's deal with a phase shift. Because that wasn't any particular special point to me. I'm definitely not wanting to start a sine function there or a cosine function. Like, that's just icky. So today, phase shifts are not the end of the world. They probably make your life a lot easier in the long run. So just if you see a phase shift, work with it. I didn't write down a single one of those numbers. I hope y'all did. All right, moving on. This is a, a YouTube video. I don't have my sound on, though. I think it's an animation. Or it's going to tell me it's like a bad video and I can't watch it. That'd be embarrassing. I should have previewed this first. Oh, man. What is it? <laughs> Welcome. Oh. 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 I think there's sound that is kind of important for this. So let's just skip ahead for a moment. Yeah. Yeah, they, oh, they make little Ferris wheels and, oh, and they animate them. That's really cute. We're not going to do that. I bet that's real exciting. Let's move on to something even more exciting. A physics problem involving a spring and a weight. This is a good time, kids. Again, I'm not saying all these examples are wonderful. They kind of get progressively more exciting. Like Rashad and his Ferris wheel. I don't know if you find this one exciting. The next one's about a tsunami. And then the one after that is about a rocket. Kind of. Actually, I don't think it's a rocket. I don't know what it is. We'll look at it. All right, so this question, bouncing spring problem. They attach a weight to a spring of whatever tension, and then they pull on it, and then it bounces back and forth. So there's a lot of information in here. you got to kind of have to sift through it. And they do give you an axis that's kind of labeled. So I want you to use their lines um, as they are labeled, which means I gotta make my own lines here. Thank goodness for drawing tools, otherwise you all would be stuck with my picture. All right, here we go, let's read. You start the stopwatch. <laughs> and when it reads 0.3 seconds, the weight reaches the first high point, which is 60 centimeters above the floor. So this maximum high point is 60. And at 0.3 seconds, which is 1, 2, 3 right here, it is way up here. So then we're going to keep reading. The next low point is at 1.8 seconds. So 6, 7, 8 reaches the low point. So here's what's going on, y'all. You don't even have a full cycle. I'm going to run out of room here. I'm not going to bother trying to finish it. You have a portion of one of the cycles. Can we just suck it up and call this a cosine graph who's been shifted over to the right? 
That would be easiest. Trust me. Um, let's talk about this for a minute, though. This was, I didn't draw very straight. This is 0.3 and this is 1.8. So from here to here, it was 1.5 seconds, right? But that's just half of the cycle. If you continued on, what would be the actual length of the period? Good. So friends are telling me the period is actually a three second span. Which we know we're going to use that to calculate B in a minute. Um, I think I didn't fill in a clue. Didn't they tell me the low point was 40? So either by calculation or just sheer brute thinking, I think y'all can figure out that the midline is a 50. And the amplitude, the size from midline to top or midline to bottom, is 10, right? The midline, which I always call K, is 50. The period is 3 seconds. That's very exciting, but I don't actually use that. We need to find b value in order to create the function. So b value is 2 pi divided by period. So 2 pi over 3. So let's see. I know it's cosine. We're just going to deal with a phase shift. We got b value. We have amplitude. We have k value. I think we're ready to rock and roll, guys. Here we go. Now, if we start our cosine right here, does that have a reflection? No, it doesn't have a reflection. So... Your amplitude shows up first in your formula. Amplitude of 10. Y'all said let's call it a cosine. Who has been shifted over, so keep that in mind. All right, the B value, which you calculated because of the length of the period, was 2 pi over 3. Now within the cosine function, factored out away from the B value is your phase shift. They want you to use T. And then again, we're shifted to the right for the start of the cosine function. So T minus 0.3. Double close your parentheses there. And then your midline, your K value, is a plus 50. This is fascinating stuff, I know. Let's go to our calculator. Get this typed into Y. You're already in radian mode, so that shouldn't be a problem. I'm going to try to be crafty and insert and overtype. Let's see if it backfires. Sometimes it's really not worth doing this, and you should just retype the whole thing. I've learned this many a times, and yet I still try. Did I get it right this time? All right, now I, I guarantee you the window's not going to work. Remember, this was a spring on a, a weight on a spring. We were measuring Ferris wheels earlier, so let's go back to window. I look ahead in the questions, and they want me to answer things like 17.2 17 seconds, so we just got to make sure that your time window goes out far enough. So I'm just going to go to 20 seconds. And then for your heights, if you look at your max and min for the spring, it's not like 40 to 60. So I'm just going to go like 20 to 80 to give myself a little. That's not what I wanted to change. Try again. For Y min, I'm going to go 20. Y max, I'm going to go 80. I like to see a little bit of space around my window, my range. And now I'm going to graph it. Fantastic. That's exactly what I thought it would look like. Not. Okay, so we're going to use our calculator to make some predictions. So when the stopwatch reads 17.2 seconds, tell me how far displaced are you from the ground? I don't know. Let's figure it out. You spoiled it for me, Adam. I was dying to find out. 43.3, what is it, centimeters? Yeah, do label these. So 43.3 centimeters. And then when, when we first started the stopwatch, what was the displacement at that point? So that would be zero. Let's find out. Well, it's 58.1 centimeters. And this is a good example of it doesn't matter where you actually start the problem. Because with this being sinusoidal, the pattern repeats over and over and over again. And whether they started the stopwatch at the exact moment that your lab partner released the weight doesn't matter. It's all about where you interpret the start and stop of your graph cycle. With it being patterned, it doesn't matter. We have a question coming up next about um, a tsunami. And that's another good case of it doesn't matter where you start and stop the time because it's patterned. Unless you're at the end of the tsunami, then it matters. 
then you get yeah a little more than just that tsunamis are pretty awful and uh you know not living on a coastal place that has to deal with tsunamis i don't really think about it but i think we've all seen tides at least right so or an animation of a tide perhaps so tsunamis themselves are very slow moving very large waves caused by underwater earthquakes and i don't typically go in the ocean but i know that there's a lot of space down there it's vast it's large um have you ever seen a wave like underwater camera they're very cool so the barrel of the wave like it looks like a barrel roll kind of it's basically displacing volume of water and it's like swooping it under and then for a tsunami it's pushing it back up into a trough that goes above sea level above the normal water level and it does that very slowly for a long distance throughout the ocean coming towards the coast until eventually there's so much volume in there that it's like very devastating to whatever it's going to hit next because once it hits land it just the water has to go somewhere you know so this this question every time i do it it kind of like blows my mind because we're going to do a calculation at the end that tells you how long the wavelength is from like crest to crest and that's why people they they would say like oh when you're 30 minutes ago you couldn't even see the wave and then all of a sudden it's like huge and that's because it's incredibly slow moving and all of a sudden it's like boom <laughs> there it is so Let's figure this out, guys. Tsunami. Uh, fast. It says fast moving, moving ocean wave. I, I guess they are fast. I shouldn't call them slow. When I think of like a wave, I think of like the power that you see on like a, someone surfing on them. But tsunamis, because so much of their power is underwater, you don't really see it until it's above. So well, the water first goes down. That's a very important clue that I sometimes miss as I'm reading through these. So the way we're going to interpret this wave is from the starting point at water the main water level it's going to swoop down the wave it's going to collect the volume and then it's going to push it back up okay so what i would like to do is i definitely need a little sketch this is a good example of how some of our friends are going to be able to figure this all out um, without much help from the graph and i am not one of those friends so you i don't know why i just drew those so stupid let me move these my lines are totally in the wrong spot Try again. <laughs> there we go. All right. So when we decide to start graphing this, this is a good example of it doesn't matter where your stopwatch starts and stops because you're just measuring it. They flat out tell you information in this question. It says the period is 15 minutes. So with that being said, and I keep reading, there's no sort of phase shift in this question. So let's just say our water starts at its normal water level, but then it says it's gonna move down first, meaning it scoops the volume out. And it's gonna come back like this, okay? So are we looking at sine or cosine this time? It would be very brilliant of you to call this a sine graph. Now, what else is special about this sine graph? It's since it's moving down initially, it's going to be reflected. So I'm going to forget that. So I'm going to hurry up and draw a negative symbol and then leave a little space for amplitude. And then I'm going to draw a sign and then we'll work with this in a minute. <clears throat> All right. Period is 15 minutes, which means I should be able to calculate the B value because B value is two pi divided by the period. Boom. That goes right here in the formula. And because we're not having any sort of a phase shift, I can just go ahead and put the variable t, which they don't want to use t this time instead of x or theta. Now there's some other information here we got to read through. It says, suppose a tsunami with, oh man, they just flat out told you this, amplitude of 10. So I'm going to stick a 10 in front. And I know that the distance from here to here and here to here is 10. But keep reading because there's another important clue out there. The normal depth of water at this point should be 9 meters. Okay, so the water level should be at 9. That's the midline. But the amplitude of the wave is going to bring it up and down 10 meters from that point. So if you're trying to fill in your graph, that's what it looks like. I just don't know that we necessarily needed all that information for the function. Because the next thing I need for the function 
is just this plus nine off to the backside. The midline, the normal water level, is nine. Meters? Yeah, meters. All right, to your calculator. Get this guy typed in. Radian mode should still be there. Um, the way this gets typed in, is it 15? Yeah, 15. You don't need another set of parentheses because there's no phase shift. And a lot of kids look at that and they think I'm dividing by x, but because I didn't use another set of parentheses, x is actually in the numerator with the 2 pi. If I didn't use another division sign or parentheses, I know that looks like it's typed wrong, but it is typed right. But I do need a plus 9 on the end. There we go. Window! I'm sure this isn't good. What do they want from me later? 2 minutes, 4 minutes, 12 minutes. Okay, I'll keep the 20, 20 minutes. I don't care. And then for my heights, I need to go beyond negative 1 and 19. So I, I'm going to go like negative 5 and 25. Now let's graph. Okay, so now I can answer all their questions for them. So at 2 minutes... Your water level is at 1.6 meters. At 4 minutes, your water level... Now this confuses kids because they're like, how do you... <laughs> your water level is at like negative 0.9 meters. What does that mean? Negative 0.9 in reference to what? Regular sea level. Regular sea level. Very good. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly right. So depending on like tide, there's sea level and then like normally my tide is at here at this time of day well our normal water level for this particular part of the ocean was supposed to be i forgot what it was already nine but it's way farther below that <laughs> yeah and it's because it's in the bottom part of the swell of the wave all right and then there's another question 12 yeah right past that peak this is where I have to remember we're measuring in meters. So that's actually pretty darn high. That's a pretty big wave, man. Quick, do the calculation for me. My stupid American brain can't figure it out. 50 something. It's big. The answer is it's big. And it's going to clobber you, so get out of the way. Okay. So the. Yeah, don't be swimming right now. That's true. Well, I. I don't know, maybe you do want to be swimming. Let's swim that way. I don't know, I don't know how waves work. <laughs> Good luck, guys. So let's answer that other question, though, us being so landlocked. Yeah, did you do the calculation for me? Oh, so off. Dang. I always, like, make up a number for meters and kilometers. I just can't remember. Stupid American brain. When we switch, I'm going to be devastated. I'm going to be happy for everybody else in the world, but I am going to be off my game big time. I don't think we're ever, I don't think we'll ever switch. Not in my lifetime, at least. You young people, make the change. Okay, um, answer that question, though, about, and Adam kind of already touched on this. The bottom line here, this minimum line was negative one meters. And he interpreted that as one meter below sea level was like the bottom of the swell. And that's exactly right. Yeah. And not necessarily the water level at that time, but sea level itself, which is a little different because of tide. Everything changes. Oh, man. Uh, this question, this is the final question here. And I do want to talk about this. Oh, no. I do want to talk about this one because I think this really puts it in perspective for people like me who like can't even envision what a tsunami looks like and what it does. Um, the wavelength would be measuring from crest to crest. And there's a piece of information here that tells you and again, my American brain can't handle this, but it travels 1,200 kilometers per hour. That's fast, I think. But it's, in the, yes, so we're, that's fast. And I think this is what makes them so devastating, is the fact that so much, and you don't see them coming until they're here. And then you're like, wow, there it is, this 60 whatever foot wave is in front of me. Oh no, what, what was the calculations? Big enough. 
I don't know. We'd have to Google that. You want to fact check this one? Is this fake news, people? I don't know. 1,200 kilometers per hour. Adam pointed out something very important to me. Um, labels, man. We were measuring in minutes, I believe. The period length was in minutes. So the first thing we need to do is calculate this per minute. So one hour is 60 minutes. So a little calculation here. This would be 200 kilometers per minute. That was really ugly handwriting. I apologize. Again, that doesn't mean a lot to my American brain, but I know that's fast. So let's talk about this. Every minute, um, it travels 200 kilometers. And from crest to crest, that would be the length of the period, right? So isn't the period 15 minutes? What's that number? 3,000 kilometers. Which my stupid American brain says miles, but you know, it's not the same. But ish. That's. Oh, we measured in meters? Oh, that's okay though. That's okay. Because it's, it's. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of label issues happening right now. The, the period length is the time in specific. So that won't make a difference. The the height, if I wanted to incorporate like something about the height of the wave, I'd have to go and convert it. But for now, it's good. The wavelength, though, three thousand kilometers, man. That's far. I don't want to think about that anymore. All right. Huh? Um. You want me to convert it? Gosh. Yes. Three meters, yes. Per minute. That's very fast, too. Wait, no, that doesn't make sense. Something's wrong there. I don't know, Adam. Don't make me mentally calculate things in metric, of all things. Let's move on from that question. Um, let's talk about, I love this, rocket science. This is not rocket science. This is like, hey, Bob, hold your timer up. This is not how NASA does things, guys. But the spirit is there. So when something is launched into orbit, satellite, rocket, whatever, it is launched from a launch site. So like the example they use here is Cape Canaveral. Anybody been there? Anybody been there? Yeah. It's cool, right? Yeah, I'd like to go. Did you get real close? Yeah, we took the bus to it. Ah, very neat. It was really stormy, though, and we did the, like, yeah. Oh. Uh, but yeah, like you're supposed to be able to see the vehicles that were building from like forever away, basically. Yeah. And uh, like we got to like under half a mile away, and it's still too far because of the speed. But it's really big. Was it worth it? Even yeah. with the storm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go back. Maybe, so, maybe you'll work. We're, we're going we're going this summer. Again. So was we're, this for family or for For family. Okay. Yeah. It's really fun. We saw we saw it three days worth of us. So uh the satellite is fired into orbit from wherever they're firing from, but it is not actually on the equator typically, like Cape Canaveral is not on the equator clearly from that really detailed map up there. So you can track it based on the equator. Like when they're looking at latitude, longitude lines, like it's based on the equator for, I would get these wrong. Is this latitude? latitude looks like Latin. Okay, those, yeah. So when we go to kind of graph this out, I'm going to use the equator as my central point, or my central line in this case, my midline. And everything else, we'll just base off of that. So, equator, let's call that zero. So, they give you some information here. Ten minutes after it leaves the Cape, it reaches the first, furthest north distance of 4,000 kilometers. So, ten minutes in, so I'm just going to start my little graph here at ten minutes. It's going to be up here at 4,000, above the equator. And it orbits in a sinusoidal fashion. That's what they're trying to get after here. <clears throat> doesn't just shoot off into space you know it doesn't work that way um where's the rest of it oh now be careful here half of a cycle later 
It reaches the furthest south distance. So it does one of these, right? And it doesn't quite tell you about the rest of this, but we can imagine what's going to go on. There is a clue, though. Keep reading. Oh, and that was also 4,000. Now we're going to call it negative 4,000, indicating that it is beneath the equator. Below the equator. Um, there's the clue I'm looking for. The satellite completes one orbit every 90 minutes. That is period. So, if you wanted to fill in some information on this, this guy here, you sure could. We know the full period is 90 minutes, so if it starts at 10 minutes... It would end at 100 minutes, and if you wanted to label this midpoint, you could. This would be half of the period, right? So 45 minutes later, it would be 55. All of this, though, isn't going to help you write the function. All you needed was the period, because now you can go and calculate some things for you. All right, man, this is like your birthday, guys. I just told you a bunch of things. K, the midline is 0. The amplitude is 4,000. Uh, clearly this is a shifted cosine graph, unless you want to get weird. And we can calculate the B value by taking 2 pi and dividing by the period, which was 90 minutes. Now this I would like you guys to simplify. I don't know why I wrote over the top of my own stuff. Pi over 45 is what I'd like to see in your function. Not reflected. All right, let's do this. Y equals amplitude. I already forgot what it was. 4,000. We decided to start it right here, so it's a cosine. Um, we do have a phase shift and a B value, so watch out. B value is pi over 45. With a phase shift of right 10 seconds, they do want you to use T, so watch your variables. So T minus 10. And then normally I'd put a plus midline here, but our midline is zero, so I'm going to put nothing. Now. I'm all paranoid that we screwed up that wavelength question. Apologies, Internet. I feel like I messed something up in the labeling. Adam, you got me all paranoid. I'll come back to it tomorrow when I realize what stupid thing I did. Because you know it happened. Anywho, on your calculator, guys, you would type this into calculator. Type carefully with double parentheses and everything. And uh, we're running a little short on time, so I'm just going to tell you in case you're not there. For 41 seconds, it came out to negative 2236.8 kilometers. Now, that doesn't mean like below below ground. It's measuring beneath the equator, so southern hemisphere. And then 163 seconds was one negative 1, 2, 3, 6, 0. 0.1 kilometers. Again, southern. Oops, I skipped one. 25 was 2,000 kilometers. And then at zero, where they launched from Cape Canaveral, according to this model that we created, it's 3,064.2 kilometers, which... Cape Canaveral is approximately 3,154 kilometers above the equator. So that's pretty darn good. Again, Bob and friend, when they were measuring things, they were like, eh, period of 90 minutes. Like, I really doubt it's exactly 90 minutes. And I also highly doubt that their 10-minute 10 10 minute measurement for the phase shift was exact. And I don't think any of these measurements are exact. So when you're talking about throwing things up into orbit, decimal points make a difference. There. There's an invisible decimal. There's no sig figs. There's not any further sig figs in that problem. There's not any further ones. Well, did it say that? Oh, I don't know about that. I'm exactly sure you got to do your homework tonight. Worksheet 16 and 17.